Hey, what is up Rock Harbor? My name is Ben Shank, lead pastor of Awakened Church, and I wanna say thank you. Thank you for your investment in Awakened Church. Over the last two weeks, God has been doing some incredible things in our midst. We've seen over 20 people give their life to Jesus for the very first time, and over 30 decisions have been made. That's because of you and your investment. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your encouragement. Thank you for your financial support. Know that we don't stand here on our own, but we stand here on your shoulders because of your investment into us. On behalf of all of our team, on behalf of myself and my wife, I want to say thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We're so excited to see what God is going to do in the future. I want to start by <laughs> praising God for that. That's awesome. We love Ben and Savannah, and we're honored to be able to partner with them. And so we say we partner with local churches, partner global and, and even nationally. What we mean by that is we come alongside, whether that be financial um, we come alongside with coaching, encouragement. We try to create a network. We once were a church plant and a church launch, and so we've been through some different phases, so we're honored to be, be part of that. So not just in Round Rock. I, I got the, the different churches that we're currently partnering with. One in, That's in Austin, Texas. How many of you guys have been to Round Rock? Wow. I thought you'd be like, Magnolia. Yeah, that's just a little ways away, okay? Like that Waco place, the wacko place. Okay. Um, Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Uh, Maitland, Florida, Missoula, Montana, Kansas City, Missouri, Yakima, Washington, Boston, Massachusetts, and Portland, Oregon. And so those are some of the churches we're able to be part of and be these initial stages of launching and planting and coming alongside and seeing some of them have already even planted churches out of them. So to see that exponential uh, generosity and multiplication, that's the goal. We want to plant churches that plant churches. We want to make disciples that make disciples. Our goal isn't to just make a disciple. It's to make a disciple that makes a disciple. And that's what a true disciple does is we multiply ourselves. And so globally, we've been able to plant two churches in Manila. We just launched our second one uh, this year. Uh, we also planted one in Guatemala along with our feeding center. We've got a team going down getting to visit Pastor PJ Hernandez and the team that's going on there. And then we also planted a couple of churches in Argentina, in Cordoba, Argentina. And so we love the global side. Even locally, I'm part of a group called City Network. And uh, there's five of us pastors that headed up this effort to try to plant 100 churches over the next 15 years in our valley. We know our valley is growing and we want to make seats and space for that. So whether it's planting out of our church, multi-siting out of our church, or when planters come to town, we get the opportunity to re relationally uh, get to know them and then help them to set down roots and build up bodies of Christ, people that are going to go and share the gospel with others. And so locally, between partnering with Table Rock Church, which meets at the Train Depot, One Life Church in Nampa, Redemption Hill, up by Capitol High School, Create Church that's just getting started, Passion Church, which is down in, they're at the Gowan Outlet Malls, um, uh, Rev 22 downtown, a Kingdom Church that's going to be launching in North Boise, a Stonehill Church, we sent them out with 300 plus people and planted them directly out of us just south of the freeway, and then Trademark, Mustard Seed, there's a couple other churches we've been able to to be part of. And it's just an honor. We love seeing the gospel spread forth. And so um, that's where we sit as a church right now. We get the opportunity to plant a new multi-site hub venue. And so in doing that, I want to bring up Brandon and Amber Morse who are leading that team for us. And uh, yeah, let's give them a big hand. Man, I love you guys. And uh, we're honored to be able to get over here. You want a kiss? No, no, oh, okay. no, no. We're going to greet each other with a holy kiss. That's only in the Bible, not in real life. Okay, so, um, no, you guys are just a huge blessing to our church. And I remember when you walked in with your family of what was five back then and has now become six, um, and we met in the lobby out front and just talking about what church is, what life looks like, I knew instantly you guys were a perfect fit culturally. You had enough crazy that it, it fit right in with the real stinking, and you guys are a huge blessing uh, to our church. Um, you also match in flannel. Did you guys, and you got like, hey, let's wear our brown shoes, accent it with some colored jeans. Um, so, I shouldn't, should have stayed focused there for. Um, but you guys are a huge blessing. What I noticed from the very beginning, you guys launched into being part of a group and then leading a community group. And your community group has multiplied. I don't want to, like, 
say this out loud, but maybe more than any other group. You guys have made groups, created leaders, made groups, created leaders, and now this is an opportunity you're doing at a different scale, you know. I love you guys. And uh, I know this isn't like farewell forever, um, even though sometimes I'd like for it to be, Brandon. Um, <laughs> I only say that because I'm getting emotional, but it's uh, for, for now, getting to see you go and lead in this way. And I know we're launching with two services and an awesome team around you guys and a great uh, group of people that are serving as leaders and a great group of people that are on staff. And as I got to be part of, you know, you had a little bit of a work day yesterday and working in the community and be part of the launches, God has set apart a special team. Uh, we're going to fill that place up, not just one time, but two times and maybe more times. I don't want to get anybody stressed out, but I feel multiplication <laughs> is going to happen. And I believe that possibly, by God's grace, the first service you have there, somebody's going to come to Jesus. And that's why we're doing it. We're doing it so people who don't know Christ will come into a relationship with him. And I want an opportunity to be able to pray for you guys. And if you're part of our hub video venue launch core team would you please stand if you're in the room and you're part of the the launch core team yes please stay standing standing i want to pray for you and for the morses god we are so grateful for this awesome team that you have you have planted you have multiplied and that you're going to grow god we know that it's just begun Thank you for this journey that we are honored to be on. Thank you for setting apart Brandon and Amber, their hearts open and willing, and uh, just to say, you know, I want to see Rock Harbor, but more importantly, the gospel go forth. And uh, God, we lift up that community. I know it's only a few miles away, but I also know that there are people to reach. And as we uh, had a special time of prayer, even just a couple of weeks ago, and have been praying uh, since then, God, that you're stirring up even with a mailer that went out, even with a group of people that went out into the community and served yesterday and that are inviting uh, for this coming week. God, it's, it's going to be you. This is all you. It's your glory. And let us not just uh, think about uh, seeing rooms be full, but seeing hearts and lives be full and alive in you. It's by your name and your grace that we celebrate. Amen. You want to hug it out? Yeah, let's hug okay. it out, all three of us together. <laughs> okay, love you guys. Our mission as a church is to love and lead one another to be devoted followers of Jesus. And devotion means we're willing to do whatever it takes. Um, leading and loving for Jesus, it's, a, it's an opportunity we have to say, hey, what is it that Jesus did and how can I emulate that? And you know, when Jesus was here on this earth, he spoke uh, some pretty unique stories and he told parables and he was telling a story about a master who was having a banquet at his home, yet there were seats at the table that had yet to be filled. And so in Luke 14, 22, here are Jesus' words. He says, and still there is room. Still there is room. And the master said to the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and compel the people to come in that my house may be filled. I want to talk about the empty seat because still there is room. And what we've been given is a lot of empty seats that you see in this room. Brandon's going to bring out an empty seat for us just to illustrate. You know, preaching four services is a long day. Um, and so I'm going to sit down here on a throne. Um, no, I'm not. But seeing empty seats, and we've been talking about, hey, let's create seats, let's create seats, and to do whatever it takes to, to make room, room for one more life, one more soul, not to just have full rooms, not to just have, you know, loud singing, not to have excite, excitement, but more importantly that, the joy of the Lord that's in li alive in us, that these empty seats would be filled. You know, when I think about an empty seat, and I think about what Jesus was saying, he said, go out and compel people to come in. See, I've never seen an empty seat surrender its heart to Jesus Christ. I've never seen an empty seat baptized. I mean, we could probably do it if we could fit it in that trough. Um, but, I mean, it would be pointless, right? I mean, you just have a wet seat is what you're going to have after that. I've never seen an empty seat see its marriage completely restored. I've never seen an empty seat have its life changed and get on fire for Jesus Christ. I've never seen an empty seat give sacrificially to the point that it's completely changed the world. I've never seen an empty seat get a group of friends that happen to be their age and when they're having a tough time in high school or a middle school, be able to look to one another and say, we can make it through this together. 
saying, I'm not sure my life's worth living, but saying, yeah, it is. You've been set apart for a purpose. See, I don't see that with an empty seat. But I do see that with the souls and the lives that sit in them. You know, I remember a time when there were a lot of empty seats. When we began as a church, our first service, we had a curtain that we put up at row five that covered all of the seats back there. The curtain just stood up right there. And I'm standing up here talking, and people are coming in going, big room, what's behind the curtain? They walk in through an empty room, and they're like, whoa, there's 17 people up there. That's amazing. We were trying to create a little bit more an intimate environment, you know. And then I remember when we went to the sixth row with it, and the seventh, and then the eighth, and I remember when we took it all down. I remember when one service got full, and we said, we got to create more seats, and we went to two. We got to create more seats, and we went to three. We got to create more seats, and we planted a church of over 300 people. We got to create more seats, and we went to four. And now we're going to six in another location. When lots of people are like, I can't believe you're still portable. I can't believe you do four services. You have a 13 minute passing period. I can't believe it's possible. Like, only God can do that. I'm like, yeah, only God. but it's time to fill the seat. Like we've created seats so that we could fill the seats. We've created an opportunity for more people to hear the message of Jesus Christ. What's the goal? Is the goal to have a big church? No. Is the goal to have a full room? No. The goal is to fill heaven. You know, we have a father that loves us and he wants a lot of people around his table. He says, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. See, an empty seat can be a missed opportunity. And God has given us the opportunity to make a sacrifice. And we've seen it time after time after time again. You know, I said it last week, but it's in your program this week as one of the blanks that you can fill in. Found people find people. Found people find people. And we will go out and seek and save those who are lost. And for some of you, you were wandering, and God brought you here. Some of you had a relationship with Jesus, but you'd kind of given up on church. Some of you didn't know who Jesus was. Believe it or not, some of you had never heard the name of Jesus, believe it or not. That wasn't just simply taken in vain. Some of you thought it was all about religion, and you came to find out that it's about a relationship. And some of you went from being private in your faith to going public in your faith. In fact, after today, 970 of you. 970 people have been baptized in six and a half years. One person said, woohoo. And my prayer is by the day that we turn seven, we'll see a thousand people be baptized. And it's not about hidden number and, you know, somebody gets a bonus or anything like that. It's, (laughs) It's honestly an opportunity to say that's a thousand lives that are saying, I follow Jesus. Going from darkness to light and publicly celebrating that. Going down and making a complete, you know, mess of the river, you know. Coming in and not making a mess in here, darn it, because we want to take care of this school. (laughs) But to say, a horse trough, sign me up. Did you hear those girls? Did you hear their voices? You hear their hearts cry out? That's because there was an empty seat. The Sudan family was one one of the first families that came to Rock Harbor Church. Ryan riding on his motorcycle. <laughs> He'd ride in on that rotor. You remember that? Like, I can't believe your wife let you drive that. Well, she used to. You don't have any more, do you? No, you don't. <laughs> I don't know if that's your choice or it was your choice. Okay, there we go. They're going to be in re-engage um, after this service. But it's pretty amazing to see like what God has done, sacrifice and service, and saying, "How do you want to use me?" See, this church in in Corinth, they were fired up. There were some crazy things going on. They were mixed up in a culture that could be very confusing, and some of it found its way into the church, and Paul has been addressing it, and he's been trying to shape them up. He's been trying to get them worked out. But you know what he saw in them? He saw life. And the reason they were having some of their challenges was because they were growing. They were multiplying. There were people coming to Jesus, and Paul's coming in and saying, hey, just get this lined out, and we'll be a little bit better. 
And I asked at the Hub venue a couple of weeks ago when we were having an orientation and a service and really compelling and reminding people what it was all about, like, who are your three? Who are the three people that God's placed in your life that don't yet have a relationship with Jesus? Maybe they're done with religion. They're done. They've given up on God because they've been let down by some church or some person. Who are your three people? I didn't say who are three people that go to another church that you can invite them to come to ours. I didn't say that. I didn't say who are three people that still live in California that's your family or friends that you want to invite, you want them to live here and they're going to come to our church. I didn't say those three people. I love them. God bless them. I didn't say the 300,000 people that still live in California that might be moving up here over the next 50. I didn't say them. Who are the three people that you do life with? They might be another mom on your soccer team. It might be another coworker, friend, but life that needs to be changed. Students, I'm going to up it a little bit for you. Not just three. Who are your eight? Who are your eight? Because every classroom you sit in, generally there's someone on your front left, there's someone in your middle front, somebody in your right, right front, and then you got someone here and here and here and here, and those are eight seats sitting around you. Eight times a day. That's 64 people. My math ain't that bad. You'll never be in a space where you're going to have more evangelistic opportunity than right now. That doesn't count everybody on your team. That doesn't count everybody that you hang out with. That doesn't count everybody you eat lunch with. That doesn't count everybody that you borrow things from, that you go, you have a locker next to, and on and on and on and on. Who's your three? Who's your eight? Who are the people God's placed around you that don't yet know the love of God? You know, as we've been studying 1 Corinthians, it's just crazy how everything lines up in God's perfect time and season, and we claim the victory of Christ. You know, it says, oh, death, where's your sting? Oh, grave, where's your victory? For death has been crushed underneath the foot of God. That it's only by his grace and his faithfulness, it says, but thanks be to God who gives us this victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Victory. Victory. We saw our church go from 17 people behind a curtain to two services. And when God moved and we said three services, and God moved and we said, let's send out 300 people in a church plant. Then God moved and we said four four services. And now we're saying six services with a video venue and we're utilizing space and we're making room and we're asking people to make sacrifice. Why? Because death has been swallowed up in victory. How do you think Satan feels about Rock Harbor Church? How do you think he feels about us? Those dang real stinking people. Like, you know, I mean, he doesn't like us one bit. But he has plans, right? He wants us to get caught up in things that don't really matter. He wants us to get caught up in the business. He wants us to be discouraged by being portable. Oh, death, you're swallowed up in victory. You have no idea. This morning it's set up. You should have seen people were like out of control, like being hilarious, messing around. I'm like, dude, chill out. It's a table. You know, they're racing each other and having fun. And I was like, okay, well, that's strange. Um, But we're having a good time for God. I mean, it's like we're out there serving and it's just like the joy of the Lord's our strength. And then Satan's like, hey, what if? What if I delay their building process? I'm not calling planning and zoning Satan. Okay, I did not say that. (laughs) But what if Satan's going, hey, you know what, let's just delay them. Let's see. That's not our, our vision is not a building. Our vision is the lives and hearts of people. It's to build lives. Like, we're going to do whatever. Do we believe that that's going to happen someday? Absolutely. We trust in God's perfect timing in that. Do we believe that a building could give us an opportunity to multiply like we never have before? Absolutely. But our hope isn't set on, you know, tree farm and chendon. Our hope is set in Jesus Christ. Is God going to stir up in hearts to see something happen that we never thought was possible? Absolutely. Is God going to stir up through this process of sacrificial giving and making a sacrifice to cause us and move us to become people that we've never been and to trust Him in ways that we never have before? Absolutely. Is God going to stir up in an individual to be radically generous in a way that they don't know how it's ever going to happen, but God did something miraculous and someone's going to give at this level and someone is going to give at this level, but there's no big, there's no small. God honors the widow with two mites. It's all of us coming together to make a sacrifice. Absolutely. And Satan's sitting there going, oh, if I could just get some of them not in but when everybody's in it changes everything 
We're all committed. We're all joining this anthem. We're all watching death be crushed by victory. Death, where's your sting? And Paul is trying to remind this church, like, be immovable. Verse 58, be immovable. Be steadfast. Always abound in the work of the Lord, knowing that the Lord, in the Lord your labor is not in vain. How many of you woke up this morning and said, hmm, am I abounding in the work of the Lord? Like no one, right? Okay, but this verse says it, so let me ask that question. Are you abounding in the work of the Lord? Do you know how hard it is to plant a church? Yeah, some of you do. Do you know how hard it is to go from one service to two? Do you know how hard it is to set up for seven years? Tear down for seven years? Trailers and pickups and random things and hauling every, everybody that works here pulls, puts stuff in the back of their car. It's like, I'm glad they don't charge us for U-Haul work and they just keep serving here for the glory of God. How hard it is to go to three services? How hard it is to plant a church? How hard it is to go to four? How hard it is to go to six? Like, it's work. But it is a worthy work. And it is a load that's actually light to bear because we do it together. It's one that the work is light because the worship is strong. And God gives us the strength to join him in this. This is what it means. Like, I didn't know six and a half, seven years ago whenever God put in my heart to talk about gather, scatter, and matter. Gather in a large group environment. Scatter into community. And then matter. Make a difference. Let's engage in community at a whole new level. Let's radically give to one another. Let's serve one another. Let's not just attend church, but let's be the church. And this gather is really what Paul's talking, or this, the matter is really what Paul is specifically talking about. Because here's what he says in verse number one of chapter 16. He says, now concerning the collection for the saints as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and to store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. He's saying, I go church to church to church to church, and I ask everybody to give an offering to pay as I have to travel, but also because we get to plant churches, and we're going to need financial resource in order to get that in these places. I'm asking Galatia. This isn't just me asking you. But let me tell you, I'm writing you this letter because I'm going to come see you because I can't wait to see you. But when I get there, don't make me have to sell that we need to keep planting churches because we done once already planted you. And so we need to continue planting. Somebody made a sacrifice so that you could be planted. Somebody made a sacrifice so you and your friends and your family could come to know the love of Jesus. Hey, let's not, let's not be about this business and going, you know, we're going to need 20 more dollars. We need 20 more dollars in order to plant a church in Thessalonica. Okay, I'll just stand here and wait. Actually, shekels. Okay, we need 457 shekels. I'll just wait until we, he said, no, have that done. That's a first priority. That should already be done. We give first and foremost out of the first fruit of our heart. That should already be done. When I show up, let's get about the business of discipleship. Let's talk about the things of God. Let's not be talking about the, should we have already prioritized our financial giving? He said, no, that should already be done. There should be no collecting when I get there. You know, God has given us three very clear gifts that's spelled out throughout Scripture. You've probably heard it talked about here before. It's our time, it's our talent, and it's our treasure. You know how we have like a, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, that they're all God, but they have different elements? These gifts are all gifts, but they have different facets. Time, treasure, talent are not the same thing. So we can't say, you know what, I give my time, so I don't have to give my money. No, God gave everything. Gave us the Holy Spirit, gave up the gift of his son, the son gave his life. So we can't say, you know what, I give my time, but I don't have to give my talent. I give my time, but I don't have to give my money. I give my talent. Have you ever seen me set up tables? Like, I'm a king. Like, it's a rodeo for me. Like, I just go out there and I just do it, and I'm, boom, eight seconds, you know, put the table up. Glory to God. That's a talent. Like, when I lead small group, man, those kids are just enthralled. They just love it. And man, when I lead my small group in my house, like, people love it. We host in our home. It's open. No, it's not, it's not one or the other. It's these are gifts that are given, and we're to honor God in those gifts. And this is saying, like, let's not hold back. One of our values, well, two of our values here at Rock Harbor are prayer and generosity. We want to see our community impacted for Jesus Christ by the way we pray and what we give away. The way that we pray, where prayer goes forth for us, and then what we give away, our generosity comes right behind it. We will have open hands. 
We have open hearts to be led by him, and we have open hands to see how he leads us in the resources that he's gifted us. How we pray, what we give away. We serve a God of excess. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills, and I haven't checked the price of beef lately, but that's a lot of money. The cattle on a thousand hills. They're all his. Like, he's not sitting here going, "Mm, Tim, Tim, if you would give 20 more dollars, just think about all the people that can come to me because of your gift. He's not sitting here going, man, I can't do it because I don't have enough money. He lets us join his ministry. He lets us join by our open hearts and our open hands and saying, God, you've given it. I don't want to, I want to prioritize you. I don't want to have to have some collection come and it's going to change the dynamic of things and we can't be about your business. Like, God, we want to be people that let's, let's give something that costs something. Not give a tip, not give out of the excess that we have, but rather give in a priority and say this matters and this is important for seeing the gospel be spread. We don't need to be stingy. Should we be wise? Yeah. But we should have prayerful and generous hearts. And Paul's just saying, hey, be ready when I come. You hear us talk about loving and leading a lot here, and I want to add two more today. It's not to our vision, it's just for today's message. It's love, lead, fight, bleed. Love and lead, fight, and bleed. See, Paul loved this church. They get a bad rap because they were into some stuff and culture had gotten crazy, but it was growing. They were having growth problems. And now he's saying, hey, be focused on the things that matter. Paul says this to him. He says in verse 5, 6, 7, he says, perhaps I will say with you and even maybe spend the winter. This must be like Arizona. It must have been a good place to spend the winter, right? He said, I don't, I don't want to just see you. I don't want to just see you in passing. I hope to spend time with you. And then he says this word, if the Lord permits if the Lord permits, how are your plans? Do you put a plan together and then you just pray for that plan? You play, pray blessing over your plan that you put together. You say, God, I want to honor you in my plan that I put together for you. Someone came up to me after the last service to kind of give me a better sermon. And they said this, hey, you need to say this, man's pl- man plans, God laughs. And I'm like, ooh, that's good, I'll say that. Thanks, Tom McDonald. Um, <laughs> but it's true, right? Is your life interruptible? Or do you put a plan, plan together and you play a little Jesus dust over the top? <laughs> it comes down, a little Jesus glitter. You ask him to bless what you put together. If the Lord permits... You know, it's kind of like we'll put an address into our phone and then it tries to reroute us. And we're like, no, I know the fastest way. How many of you guys, you put an address in your phone just so that you can beat whatever time it tells you that you're going to make it? Like 19 minutes, dude, I can do this in 16 and a half. You're like 15, bam, what up, ways? You know what I mean? (laughs) It's like, it's more of a challenge. But sometimes when it's rerouting, it's for a purpose and a reason. It's because a road might be closed or there's some construction that's going on, something that you don't actually know, believe it or not. And he's saying, like, if the Lord permits, like, I would plan to be with you. I love you guys. A real leader loves, and I want to be there. I want to spend this time with you. But if I get redirected, I'm going to trust him. Then he goes on to say this. He says, for there's a wide door of effective work that is open for me in Ephesus. A wide door of effective work that is open for me. And guess what? There are many adversaries. He says, if the Lord permits, I'm going to get to you. But as for right now, there's a wide door that's been opened for me. And there's many adversaries. Some of you, God has opened up a wide door. And I want you to know that there's going to be adversaries. There's a wide door for ministry that's opened up for us. And we're launching this venue. There's a wide door that we're saying, hey, invite people to come in. We're not going to sit here and say, you know what? It's kind of good right now. We can, can kind of control this amount of people. We can create a little holy huddle. We can have this small church kind of vibe and feel and all those, those things are good. It's not about size. You know what we want? We want a healthy church. We're not trying to fill a room. We're trying to fill heaven. We've made empty seats so that we can fill empty seats. There's been a wide door that's open for us and there's going to be many adversaries. Acts 19 gives more detail around that. Then he goes, hey, be careful with my friend Timothy, verse 10 and 11 or so, maybe 12. He's like, my friend is coming. He's a little bit insecure. He's a little bit timid, but give him some time. He's a good dude. Like, I'm a disciple. I'm making a disciple. Just give him a little bit of space. 
love him and follow his leadership because God's began a good work in him. You know what he's doing? Love and leading, fighting and bleeding. He's loving him. He's leading. You know what a real leader does? A real leader, first off, they love their people. A real leader, you know what else they do? They allow other people to lead. They don't say, it's about me. No, they, they put them on their shoulders so they can be taller. And that's what Paul's doing here. He's saying, hey, I'm lifting Timothy up because I believe God has a good work in him. Now, Paul approached things. He doesn't just allow anything. There were some divisions happening. There were some people that were leading in the wrong direction. He comes and he corrects that behavior and that action. He doesn't say, hey, keep on sinning, whatever, like, you know, just as long as you, you give a good offering and it's there when I get there, this is going to be good for everybody. No, he says, no, I'm loving others just like Jesus. He stooped the lowest and he raised leadership. He stooped really low, but he raised the leadership bar really high because it means you have to serve. Then he says, it's not just about him. And these last two verses, they're going to just rock your world, specifically if you're a man in here. It says, be watchful, stand firm in faith, act like men, be strong, let all that you do be done in love. Act like men. We're going to dig into that verse most likely in the next year or so. We're going to have a men's gathering on a weekend. I can't wait because I believe revival will come out of it. We're going to take some time, maybe on a Friday night or on a Saturday morning, and talk about what it really means to be watchful, to stand firm in our faith, to act like men, to be courageous, to be strong, but let everything we do be seasoned in love. See, a real leader, they stand firm. One of the greatest offensive positions you can ever take is standing firm in the faith that you have in God. You've got to trust Him. We have to trust God. And if you follow that list down, what word do you read? You read last. You read last. You know why? Because a leader is last. A leader puts other people in front of them. A leader says, you know what? I'm going to give up my seat so someone else can have my seat. I'm going to create seats. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to serve multiple services so I can serve the seats. I'm going to give. I'm going to create space. I'm, you know, I'm going to financially support a church so that we can have a seat so that others can have a seat, not so that I can get my seat and I can get my parking space and maybe I'll get a plaque and I can make a Mecca out of something that's earthly. No, there's a heavenly purpose behind a seat. There's a heart behind a seat. And guys, I can't go any further without talking specifically to you. My question is this, what kind of man do you wanna be? What is the goal of the life that you're living? What kind of man do you want to be? You want to just be a better man than the person on your right or the left? You want to be a little bit better man than your neighbor with the loud dog? You want to be a little bit better man than that guy at work that's a pervert? Be a little bit better man in the way that you treat your wife compared to other people that you know? You want to be a little bit better man in how you kind of hang out with your kids and you're a little bit there? Oh, let's be a better man than our dads. I'll be a better man than my dad. You have the wrong standard. You know what the standard is? The standard's Jesus Christ. That standard died on the cross for our sins. That standard, it was a cruel cross. It was an undeserved cross. That standard was sinless. That standard offered his life. That standard was raised from the dead. That standard gave us new life. That standard is coming back again. And it's to that standard whom we will give an account for what we did with our life. We have to raise our standard. Your standard isn't even in the room. The standard isn't on the stage. Our standard isn't even Paul. What a great man of God. Our standard offered himself and everything that he was for us. And if you're a father in this room, you need to be a fighter in this room. Love, lead, fight, and bleed. You need to fight and get on the floor with your kids and play with them as long as you possibly can. You need to fight for your time when you're driving home, you're preparing your mind, and you're thinking, how can I nurture my wife when I arrive at the house? You need to fight to get up early in the morning. 
get up early before everybody else so you can get a couple of things done. One being your time with the Lord. Fight for that. Fight to lead because everybody else is trying to lead those around you. Everybody else is trying to get a piece of your family. But you're going to stand and you're going to say, I'm not going to allow it to happen. I'm going to act like a man. I'm going to be strong. I'm going to stand firm. But guess what else I'm going to do? I'm going to bleed. You know where the blood comes from? It comes from love. Because greater love has no man than this than to lay down his life for his friends. Let everything, verse 14, let everything you do be in love. That's what it means to bleed because some of us mean, oh, yeah, I'm a lover, not a fighter. Yeah. Oh, no, I, I lead. I lead. Just follow me. Oh, yeah. You know what I do? I'll fight. But do you bleed? Because what you bleed comes from the inside. And I pray that that would be the same heart, the same character, the same fruit of the Spirit that was our Savior was full of. Because that's what came out of him. Because there's a life that's waiting. There's a life we get the opportunity to reach. And there are lives that might be sit sitting within just a short distance of your arm reach. And they need you to act like a stinking man. And say, I will not do this any longer. I will not be a boy. I will not be an animal. I will not try to prove myself to anyone else other than my Lord and my Savior. Because he is a man worth following. Would you bow your heads with me? I'm going to ask a couple of reflective questions for all of this in the room. Maybe you've found yourself slipping into apathy, meaning a lack of care or a lack of concern. And you may say, Keith, I care. We'll answer this. Have you seen a de decrease in the amount of time you're spending in God's word? If so, you might be apathetic. Have you seen a decrease in the amount of time that you spend in services at church on a weekend? Have you seen a decrease in the amount of time that you're spending with Christian friends and encouraging one another? Have you seen a decrease in the hard questions you've asked those around you and then you've answered about who you are and who you're becoming? Has it been a while since you invited or shared the message of Jesus Christ with someone? Have you seen an increase in caring a lot about the temporary rather than the eternal? You got your heart set on some things that are tangible in front of you. If so, apathy might have set in. And I'd just like to ask a question that I've asked at each of the services. In this room, who would raise their hand and say that I have been stirred today to love differently, to love stronger, to lead better, to fight harder, and to bleed for the one who bled for me. Who would raise their hand and say that that is me? Just in this room, I feel stirred in that. God, it's by your grace and your name, we claim your promise that you're with us in this. For some, they're going through trials. For some, they've gone through some good times. But today, you've stirred us up as a church. You've stirred us up to multiply. You've stirred, stirred us up to sacrifice. You've stirred us up to give the good gifts that you've placed within our heart, within our life, our time, our treasure, our talent. God, let us follow you to the future that you have set forth for us in this life and in eternity. Let our lives count for your name and your glory. Amen.